Frank Capra's version of Lost Horizon, based on the bestseller by James Hilton about a mythical utopia found high in the Tibetan mountains and called Shangri-La, is, no doubt, more clearly than all of Capra's other films, a fantasy. This one was Columbia's most expensive production to that time, 1937, and its tremendous success, along with six other consecutive Capra hits, turned Columbia into a major studio. Capra's fantasy films took many shapes and came in numerous disguises, but no matter how realistic he often made his stories appear, there was, behind them always, the heart and soul of a born fantasist and comedian who created a kind of world that was uniquely his. The Capra hero was not so unlike his creator, a rather innocent dreamer who comes up against hard reality yet manages not only to keep his illusions, but to triumph with them. When his 29th film, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, was released in 1939, many Washington politicians were incensed. Joseph Kennedy, then America's ambassador to London, wrote pleading for its withdrawal. But luckily, Capra convinced Columbia not to listen, and the picture became a huge success, won James Stewart the New York Film Critics Prize as Best Actor, and made him a top star in this lovingly moral fable from Capra in the guise of a muckraker. You all think I'm late. Well, I'm not licked. And I'm gonna stay right here and fight for this lost cause, even if this room gets filled with lies like these. Mr. Smith was Capra's last picture on his Columbia contract. Now he wanted his independence and became the first picture maker in the talking period to form his own company, strike out for himself with his personal credo of one man, one film. And of course, no matter who the writer or what the source, the same clear signature could always be identified on the Capra picture and nowhere more so than on his first independent film, Meet John Doe, co-starring Gary Cooper and Barbara Stanwyck, in another seemingly realistic fable, warning America in 1941 of the dangers of fascism right here at home. Why, your type's as old as history. If you can't lay your dirty fingers on a decent idea and twist it and squeeze it and stuff it into your own pocket, you slap it down. Like dogs, if you can't eat something, you bury it. After World War II, during which the director served as a major in the U.S. Army Signal Corps and made a famous series of propaganda films called Why We Fight, Capra returned with renewed dedication and together with another veteran, Jimmy Stewart, made their own favorite film and perhaps Capra's most enduring fantasy of optimism in the face of disaster, It's a Wonderful Life, released at Christmas 1946. Not a big success in its day, which was greatly demoralizing to Capra. It has nevertheless become a Christmas perennial though only Republic distributes the correct, uncut, full-length, uncolorized original version. You sit around here and you spin your little webs and you think the whole world revolves around you and your money. Well, it doesn't, Mr. Potter. In the, in the whole vast configuration of things, I'd say you were nothing but a scurvy little spider. You... And that goes for you, too. Capra made a handful of other successful, likable films, but never again quite recovered the personal and absolutely certain footing of It's a Wonderful Life. And as the 40s ended, he finally lost his cherished independence, first to the studios and then to male stars. In his wonderfully candid autobiography, The Name Above the Title, he warned future picture makers, don't compromise, he wrote, for only the valiant, the daring, and the courageous are worthy of speaking to their fellow men for two hours in the dark. And certainly Capra, this Sicilian-born immigrant who'd arrived to this country in steerage, had spoken to Americans and the world with a voice of optimism which, as Francois Truffaut has said, became a restorer of men's spirits. And since he'd started in pictures and comedy, he never really forgot that greatest restorer of spirits, shared laughter. In fact, two of his best pictures are quite simply comedies without a social message. A wild black comedy fantasy called Arsenic and Old Lace, in which Cary Grant discovers that his two sweet little old aunts have been poisoning old derelicts. Grant's take when he discovers the first dead body is justly famous. And then there's Capra's first great success, the romantic comedy fantasy It Happened One Night, which set the tone for Screwball in 1934, and won Oscars for Clark Gable, Claudette Colbert, for Capra's longtime screenwriter, Robert Riskin, for Capra as director and for best picture, a record unequaled for over 40 years. Released 55 years ago, Capra's work here is still fresh, still makes you feel great. Oh,